Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special guest coming all the way from Poland for us. But before I introduce her, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Manscaped, who's been one of my longest running sponsors. We appreciate you so much here at Holly Randall Unfiltered. If you didn't already know, Manscaped is the number one electric trimmer for below the belt grooming. They have come out with the Lawnmower 3.0, which is a revolutionary trimmer that will not nick or snag your precious balls but will leave them hair free much to the delight of your partner or partners, depending on, you know, how busy uh, you are these days. So make sure that you go to manscaped.com, use code Holly to get 20% off plus free shipping. So now we are going to introduce my guest. My guest is performer, director, and just all around badass boss bitch. Misha Cross. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I love this. I'm very good. Thank you. <laughs> Can I tell you that how impressed I am that you have like a real mic right now that you're using for this podcast? Because oh. <laughs> these remote really? podcasts, yeah, they've been really difficult for us because, mm-hmm. you know, normally we're in the studio and we have all the equipment. Right. People just walk in, we interview them and everything's, you know, set up and looks great. Yeah. But with these remote podcasts, I have to rely on whatever technology my guest has. Right. And a lot of times they don't, you know, have like an external mic or an external camera or anything like that. So we've had some episodes which haven't been like the best sound quality. Mm -hmm. So like the fact that you have a professional mic, I'm like. Yeah, but I think like also (laughs) during the quarantine, people actually bought a lot of shit because they they needed that. (laughs) Yeah. So like before COVID, we, we didn't have anything. Like I didn't even have a webcam because <laughs> I didn't really? need that. So now we yeah, have a Mac. I have a, a Logitech webcam. It's like also my boyfriend's doing some um, YouTube videos, Instagram videos. So he has a lot of gear. So I'm always borrowing from him. Yeah. yeah. Good. So how has, because I haven't had anybody from Europe mm-hmm. on my show um, lately and so how has the whole COVID quarantine thing been for you out there? Because I know it's different in country to country. Um, yeah. So like the last time that I was on the professional set was in January. Mm. Like, because um, how we do it in here is we have to travel all the time. Mm-hmm. Like I don't work at all where I live. I would mm-hmm. have to go to um, Spain or Hungary or Czech Republic to shoot. Or, or, or France or UK. So um, that pretty much put an end <laughs> to all the traveling and all the work. Like I know that people are starting shooting right now, but you still cannot travel. So like this is all like domestic shoots, like whatever they have the industry going on. I know girls shoot in, in Czech Republic or in Hungary, but they cannot travel. So yeah, this is very, very limiting. <laughs> Right. Right. And how have the, like, how is it for you just even going outside? Like, do you guys have, cause he, it's so crazy. Cause LA is so LA, sorry. The United mm-hmm. States is so divided. Mm-hmm. So certain right. states are behave very differently than other states, even mm-hmm. like certain cities within the same state behave differently than other cities. So like yeah. here in Los Angeles, especially in the city, they're very strict about wearing face masks at all times when you're outside of the house. Mm-hmm. We've just started opening restaurants, but you have to wear a face mask walking into the restaurant. Mm-hmm. You can take it off at the table, but then you have to put it back on to like mm-hmm. walk to the bathroom. Whereas in other states, it's, you know, they pretty much never close down and it's just mm-hmm. like a free for all. So oh. what's it like in Europe? Because I, you know, obviously we've heard like how bad Italy was hit mm-hmm. and I believe Spain as well. So um yeah so like europe is pretty much the same as america like we also have different countries in europe so like every country has their own um policy and laws regarding COVID right now oh sorry (laughs) and um so basically what i know what i hear on the news is that um italy is opening greece is opening spain is open like i even looked up uh holidays in uh tenerife for August, mm-hmm. like they're all open, all the shops are open. Uh, it's pretty similar as in America that wherever you go out, wherever you go to the grocery store, pharmacy, 
mall, you should put a mask on or like whatever you use a public transport, you should put a mask on. Mm -hmm. Other thing is, um, you know, there are people who, who believe in like in COVID and there are people who don't believe in COVID. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, I believe you have oh, yeah. those people also in, in America, right? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> right. So like, yeah, we sure do. <laughs> that's the main difference. Like it's not even about all the, all the policy regarding COVID. It's about like how many people believe in that, how many people are, are not believing in it, in this. So, mm -hmm. because, you know, like I have friends who, uh, say I will not put a leash on me or something. I will not put a mask on. Uh, I don't have any friends who are suffering from COVID. Like I don't have any, anyone who, who died because mm -hmm. of COVID. So, um, so this, this is the main, the main thing, like those who believe in that and those who ask questions and are full of doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You get like the conspiracy theorists and right. you get people who think like, it doesn't really exist. And there's yeah. also, you know, the idea that they're trying to develop a vaccine, which is really just a cover for like trying to implant a microchip into everybody so they can. Oh yeah. <laughs> every I mean, well, I, I am a big fan of <laughs> conspiracy, like conspiracy I really? love it because they're very interesting and mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Like, you know, I'm a big fan of that. So it gives me like another dimension to things. And like, it also keeps me very open minded. So it's not like whatever they say on the TV or whatever someone yeah. from the government says that I believe and I have no doubts. Like, I like to ask questions. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think you got to pick kind of a middle ground. Like, mm -hmm. there's, you know, like you need to be kind of like septic, but, but not, not like you don't believe in that, but you need to be kind of like, you need, you need to, to ask questions, questions right? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. politicians are full of shit. Right. Yeah. For sure. But then <laughs> everyone also knows too, that. We can all agree on that. <laughs> yeah. But I also too, I don't believe that like 5G um, makes, gives you COVID or whatever the other conspiracy uh, is. Or, yeah. That's, that's a little bit too much, even for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So there's different levels, I guess, of conspiracy theories. Right. I don't know. Right. I, I personally don't pay a ton of attention to them because I find them to be a little exhausting and just kind of ridiculous. I just try mm -hmm. to be reasonable and generally just follow whatever laws I have to follow and, um, oh, yeah. you know, think about other things in life. So right. other things like porn. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about porn because that's why we're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> So let's um let's start from the beginning. Misha, how did you get into the adult industry? Uh I got in the industry. I I thought it was I think it was 2014 or late 2013, so that's almost 7 years. Mm -hmm. Um and it's just funny because like when I got in, I was 23, so mm -hmm. I believe I was old enough to uh to know make what you decision. were doing. Like that's another mm -hmm. thing that actually is interesting to discuss that like the age you know what is the proper age to, to yeah there's industry. a lot of a <laughs> lot of controversy over that and a lot of people have very different and very right. um strong opinions about that yeah like my age was like perfect for me i would even say like you should be like 24 25 to join i don't know like mm -hmm. i'm weird about it but like yeah i was 23 um i was working before like i, I had uh, lots of different jobs uh, I was a student. I graduated sociology and photography. Um, so, like, I always knew I want to be in the in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. But well, I'm not tall enough to be a model. <laughs> also, like, I was like, I, I'm not maybe as good as an, as good actor to be like a mainstream actress or something. So, I was mm -hmm. always fascinated by porn industry. Um, and then I just decided like, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. And I've just started sending those emails to all those agencies in Europe and they got back to me. They're like, Oh yeah. You know, like they, they get back to everyone. Let's be honest. Like I was sending them pictures and they're like, Oh yeah. Can you come to a casting or something? Um, and then one day I emailed Pierre Woodman because mm -hmm. I found on his website that he is, uh, he's, he, he said something like, um, if you want to be a porn star, email me or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously I want to be a porn star and I emailed him. And then I actually did my first scene with him, uh, which I wouldn't do right now, <laughs> 
but that yeah, was my been, beginning. There's been, I've heard mixed reviews about mm-hmm. that guy. My mom, it's funny back in the day, my mom was always very jealous of him because she said that he was the ultimate cum shot King, I think is what she called him. Like oh. nobody could capture a cum shot in midair the way oh. Pierre Woodman could. Like I'm talking like oh photos God. and he was right. always really good at that. My mom was always like, how does he do that? Oh. Like but that, that's my earliest memory of Pierre Woodman. And then I've never met him. Um, mm-hmm. And then I've heard some mixed reviews from yeah. girls about him. So what was your experience? Like? Well, uh, you know what? Like from, from a perspective of a, of a 23 year old. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I, I thought he was my friend. Uh, he got me into the business. He helped me a lot. But that was also a very, very sneaky behavior. Like, this is the first time mm. that I'm actually saying this. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> so, yeah, so interesting stuff. But, like, obviously, he knows what I'm feeling about him. Like, we are not talking. Like, we haven't been talking for, like, five years, I think, already. So okay. um, it's fine. But, yeah, but, like, um, a person who I fought was my friend who tried to help me was actually using me emotionally, if you know what I mean. Like, my be- my beginnings in porn have been very, very tough, very tough. Um, nobody wanted to book me. Uh, nobody wanted to like hire me or, or even no agency wanted to represent me just because I had tattoos. And okay. I was going to ask why, mm-hmm. cause you're a good looking girl, but yeah, yeah. tattoos can tattoos, be problematic. And that's like yeah. a no, no, especially in Europe because mm. the European type is, um, you know, this sweet girl, like preferably no plastic surgery. Um, yeah. Very natural, very natural looking. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Right. Uh, which is weird because in Europe we're shooting so much hardcore scenes, like anal scenes and everything. So like th- this was just weird to me. Also, when mm. I when I thought about joining porn, like I was speaking to people, and they all said like, "Oh my god, you're gonna be so successful from day one because you look like a suicide girl." And I was like, "Oh yeah." Mm. And then I, actually, it turned out to be a big disadvantage. <laughs> so <laughs> so oh life. Um, so yeah, like he was the the, the actually the one person that uh, emailed me back and then kind of like uh, helped me to get through my beginnings and mm-hmm. helped me to get recognized by companies and agencies. But that was not all for free. Like he was kind of like he was being like. Um, can I say manipulative? Like, you know what I mean? Like he was like, Oh, I got you into the business. Um, you promised me, uh, you're going to only do anal with me. Like you're going to, I'm going to have your anal, you know, in this business, like when one company has someone's anal, Yeah, you're exclusive. Exactly. Exclusive. Um, so that was like very disturbing to me. And then also a few things happened that just made me realize like, that he is not really my friend. Like he's one of those predators and also all the other stories of the other girls. Um, they're all the same, you know, (laughs) they're all the same. The big story with, uh, Elsa Jean, right. Or like with Lana Rhodes as well. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I heard the Elsa Jean story, but I, I remember the Lana Rhodes story. Mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that I was actually, uh, DMing her on Twitter about when she was, she was in Budapest. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And she was just like, yeah, like basically saying that she's not feeling comfortable. Um, she just wants to leave. That's why she left and she never came mm-hmm. back. She just didn't feel comfortable with him. So, mm-hmm. yeah, like I was with him for like a first year of my career. We, we were uh, we were taken with him everywhere, like to Valencia for convention shows, to Bucharest for another convention, even to Berlin. But it was just like you knew you have to be nice if you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like it's not just um it's not a nice guy who means well for you it's like well he takes you uh with him but he wants something in return right for example ulterior motive like or like so you know like he knows so many things about you um it's just it's just i don't know it's just scary so i've kind of like then i went to la the first time and um he was mad at me about it that i like shot with so many companies and i like i forgot about him and i should be grateful for everything um and even like on his forum like he has this forum (laughs) woodmanforum.com 
and he was just like talking to all his to all his guys there they're like basically they worship him like god <laughs> so right. he's always right he's always right they were right. talking about me like oh misha forgot about you she's this and that so like i read that and i immediately knew like no i'm cutting ties like yeah no way yeah so that was my beginning <laughs> It's crazy to me how people have that sense of ownership over other mm -hmm. people that, you know, they helped you get your foot in the door of an industry and therefore you owe them your gratitude and everything for the rest yeah. of your life. Like we all got somewhere with the help of somebody at some point, right? Right. right. And yeah, one can be grateful, but there's a difference between being grateful and being kind of a slave, slave to right. them because mm -hmm. of, you know, the fact that they helped you initially. And I just, yeah. And also really odd. I, I think it was also because he knew that I struggled in the beginning. So, and he knew how much I cared about it. So this is, this is how people use people. You know what I mean? When they yeah. see how much you care about something, uh, they see it as, um, as something they can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Right. So he yeah. saw I was like vulnerable and I really cared and I was hardworking. Um, so he was like, yeah, you know, it's going to be okay. I just need to trust me. It was just like, oh my God, such a predatory yeah. behavior so much. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, earlier when we were kind of going over mm -hmm. back and forth about topics before we started, you know, obviously there's a lot of conversation around boundary violations and consent in the adult industry. It's mm -hmm. been a topic that's been of concern for the last, I would say, couple of years, but it's taken, it's kind of reached new heights within the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that you've experienced some of that as well. Is that specific to what you just talked about or are there other experiences that you've had? And, and what have you learned from those experiences that maybe you could pass on to newer talent mm -hmm. that could help them avoid going through the same thing? Yeah. So that was one of the, well, one of the situations, like multiple situations, but like I am thinking about it as just one situation, just right, with, right, right. including one man. Right. Right. Um, but there were a lot of, but like, I just, I don't want to be giving a bad name to the industry as well, uh, because this happens everywhere, like in all of the industries, but it is important for us to talk about it because if we don't talk about it, just because it's porn industry and just because people think that, uh, our industry is, uh, just, you know, a shady place, a really, really bad place. Uh, then we're not going to change anything. Like we need to talk about it because this, this stuff happens everywhere. Um, yeah. I mean, by being quiet about it, you're allowing the predatory behavior right. to continue because right. it's being buried and it's being hidden, but right. by coming out and using, you know, the power of the performer and using your voice to point those people out, we can push those people out of the industry. Cause mm -hmm. there's a lot of, like you said, like you said, like, it happens in every industry. And also too, you're right. We have been talking a lot about the bad things that have been happening, but there are also wonderful, wonderful people in this right. industry. There are wonderful directors and producers, yeah. companies that really care about the girls. So, you know, if we can kind of cull the herd a little bit mm -hmm. and get rid of some of the predators, then we can really open up space for, you know, the ethical companies to continue working. Right. So uh, I was, I was lucky enough not to have any major bad experience as we have seen on Twitter recently, last yeah. like, past two weeks, we have seen some really, uh, really hardcore stuff. So mm -hmm. I was lucky enough and fortunate enough not to be a part of any real hardcore um, issues on set. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like smaller things, uh, smaller things that stay in your head somehow, and then you realize how much impact they have on your life. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, like shooting for companies uh, who, who put you to do a scene with someone that is on your no list, even though they knew you wouldn't work with that person. And then so what happens? You show up and it's someone that yeah, you Yeah, and there's just someone who then, I specifically said I wouldn't work with. And then it's like, oh, we couldn't get anyone else. So what do you want to do? 
That's what happened to me many times. I remember one situation um, when I was, uh, well, I'm not going to name names because I don't think right. that's as serious. So I need to like warn people. But like mm -hmm. one of the situations was I was shooting in UK and well, I arrived, I, I took a flight, I arrived on set, I was, I was exhausted, tired. And then uh, the guy was picking me from the hotel to the location. And I'm like, okay, so who am I working with? <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I need to like, I need to ask before shooting a scene, like five minutes before, because nobody tells me this is how it works in Europe. Like nobody tells you who you're working with because they don't think this is relevant information. Right. So I, I just wanted to be like, you know, um, who am I shooting with? And uh, the guy, the director says, oh, you're shooting with this and that. And I'm like, um, but you know that, well, I said I cannot work with this guy. Like he is too big for me. Mm -hmm. Let's just put it this way. Like I have major problems shooting with this guy and he's a nice guy, but you're not going to get a good scene by putting me with him. This is like, I am telling you because you're going to be screwed after. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was like, Oh, you know, you know he's going to be very gentle with you. Uh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You're a top performer. And I'm like, okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what do you mean? I'm a good performer. I'm a good performer, but like, I know my body, you know what I mean? I'm not going to, let me, <laughs> nothing's let me guess. change that. Let me guess. This was a man who was telling you this. Of course. Of course. It yeah. Was a man. Men. There's no idea, people, idea how vagina works. It does. I was going to say, it's always people without a vagina who are like, Oh, your vagina will be fine. Like no, you I mean, won't have any problems. Like, play with it a little bit. And with dude, people. you don't own a vagina. <laughs> like yeah, you have no idea. Right. Like I, I've been, carrying my vagina for 30 years <laughs> like i know how it works <laughs> so i'm pretty much aware of um what penises can go inside of it <laughs> and yeah. this one is not entering it so yeah. uh well obviously the question was okay so what do you want to do you want to fuck up my day or you want to do the scene yeah um well and we you started traveled shooting. all that yeah, way yeah i traveled everything. i traveled yeah. for like to do two scenes i traveled for two days to do two scenes obviously I just wanted to do it. I was like, okay, let me just try. Um, and I remember I was, I was like, I did a blow job. And then obviously with the first position that was, uh, I was like, okay, let me just choose something comfortable for me. Um, I don't know, cowgirl or something. So I can just stretch it out. I remember I, I was trying so hard for like 10 or 15 minutes to put it in. Um, I started crying, but like crying, not like, you know, like I have been very, uh, like I've been raped crying. No, more like, I just can't do it. I felt stressed. Like frustrated crying. Yeah, frustrated, yeah. pressured. Uh, I was like, I just, you know, I cried because I didn't know what to do. I was just so stressed out. And the guy <laughs> looked at me with the camera in his hand. It's just like, okay, let me know when you're ready. <laughs> and I'm like, like basically my vagina is crying for help i cannot yeah. do this scene so we didn't do this scene i was like look like do you want to see the inside of it because it's pretty bad i don't even know if i'm able to do the second scene so yeah this kind of stuff you know it happened it happened to me uh let's say at least like four or five times mm -hmm. <laughs> um so um it, it really pisses me off when directors, producers don't care about what you're saying if you're a woman. This mm -hmm. happens so many times, especially when you're when, when you're a woman, because men uh, men can be divas. Let's put it this mm -hmm. way, because he needs to come right by the end mm -hmm. of the scene, and he needs to be comfortable. So they mm -hmm. always complain about, oh, this position is not good for me. I'm not going to come in this position. I just want to say, like, no one cares. Just do your fucking job. You know what I mean? Like how, like what people say to you. Yeah, just, just exactly the same situation. Uh, and they're always like, oh, I'm too cold or I'm too hot. Oh, I am sweating. I'm not going to be able to come. Like, honestly, 80% of the time. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God. Even, even like when I'm shooting at home, obviously with my Snapchat dick, that is my boyfriend. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He's always like, he's such a diva. Like men are divas. <laughs> like when we're doing a, a scene, I've seen a video in the shower. He's like, I'm not going to lay on my back. It's wet and dirty and I'm not comfortable. And I'm like, oh, tough shit. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
So yeah, this, this drives me insane. Like how we prioritize um, men's um, well-being over women's, and and women make more money in porn, so they should be a priority, right? Like we sell yeah. movies, so. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, you need that pop shot in order to close the scene because yes. porn scenes are all about the male orgasm, not the right. female orgasm, right. which is another, you know, right. topic for exploration all in itself. Mm -hmm. And the men are dealing with a very temperamental appendage, which right. may or may not work, whereas we can just slap lube on there. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's a difficult job. And that's why I personally am very picky about the guys. Good. That shoot with. <laughs> you should For be. Sure. Yeah, you should be just to save yourself some, you know, bullshit. Yeah. I remember once um, I was doing a big feature and that was a very, very long day. I think I was for Digital Playground, like a Star Wars movie or something. <laughs> oh, yes. I've shot Digital Playground movies and they are very long, very yeah, long days. very long days, especially to also... Be like, features <laughs> are just long days in general. Yeah, but. but like also in Europe, like you you need to add the traveling. So like yeah. I, I'm already tired when I'm, when I'm boarding. <laughs> yeah. So like then obviously everybody comes from a different country. So... Um, uh, we arriving the day before we are checking in our hotels and then the day starts usually 8 a.m. for makeup and mm -hmm. that was a big feature uh, with with crazy makeup it was Star Wars party so like obviously and I remember oh god <laughs> was that the one because I know that they did one fuck did they send Arya Alexander out for yeah, that one yeah and Eva <gasps> and she did get yeah oh my god yeah well, I heard about this one and a body and they, Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember he didn't like the makeup. Yeah. I was, maybe I was yeah. talking to, I was oh talking God, to the I makeup so took like eight stories. hours, yes. eight to nine hours yeah. just for makeup. I have so many stories about this shoot. That was like the best thing ever because there's just so many ridiculous stories coming out of it. So like the makeup took forever and we were um, four or five girls. It was Eva Lovia, Ari Alexander, me. Uh, I know it was Ella Hughes, but I don't know if she was body painted. And I think someone else. So like in the same time, <laughs> body oh painted. God. We had three makeup artists, but only one of them was doing the, um, you know, this kind of, uh, how do you say, like a sci-fi. Special effects. Spe special yeah, effects. Yeah, 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 yeah. This way. So that was a long day. And also we were shooting um, outside London, like in an abandoned prison or something. And that was not summer. <laughs> so it was very, very cold, no heating whatsoever. Um, so I remember we started 8 a.m. and then we finished, I think, around midnight. Mm -hmm. They were shooting like two sex scenes, I think, and also uh, some acting. And I remember that my scene was obviously the last one, obviously anal scene, obviously the last one. So say. you have to, so for those people who don't know, generally when you do an anal scene, you don't eat mm -hmm. all day. And a lot of times you right. don't eat the day before. Yeah. So for you to have to do an anal scene at the end of what sounds mm -hmm. like, what, 8 to 12, 8 well, to Well, we midnight. started shooting 9.30 p.m. Right. Oh, so, Jesus. yeah, like doing an enema the night before, um, maybe eating just a little tiny bit of bread in the morning. That's it. And mm -hmm. some gummy bears and a little bit Red Bull. Uh, that's it. That's my diet. 2000 calories. Oh, my God. Um, so, yeah, but that's how it is. And I, <laughs> I remember like going back to the to the man topic and man's ego. Um, I was shooting with this guy and it was a, it was a threesome. It was a threesome with Ella Hughes, but a threesome that she was not really doing anything. She was like, I was supposed to lick her pussy, but I was the one who was getting fucked. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the guy was, I think he was also tired as everybody, you know, but it's important yeah. that he was tired <laughs> yeah. and hungry. And um, I just, he couldn't handle the scene. Um, so he was like going to my partner. He was going to this other girl to go down on her every time, um, he tried to fuck me, do the anal scene with me. And then he couldn't do it. Obviously his dick wasn't hard. 
Um, and then he went on her, he got down on her to lick her pussy to get himself hard again. And I remember I got so pissed. I was like, this is a little bit disrespectful. If you know what I mean, mm -hmm. like that yeah. you, you actually need to stimulate yourself more. Uh, like your, you, like your penis is in my ass. That should do the trick. I guess. I don't know. And I felt like I took it very personally. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And I remember this guy said to the director that he's not doing this scene with me because I am being very rude uh, to him and he doesn't even want me to look at him anymore. <laughs> so yeah, like he was very tired. He was on set all day, obviously. So that's another thing. And everybody obviously was like on his side because they needed a pop shot. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's a thing. It's it's such a delicate balance when you're dealing right. with the guy because it's like you have to cater. You kind of have to cater to the guy so that he can yeah, finish you, the scene. Yeah, you need to be very nice to them. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's yep. funny. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And yeah. then when we're going to come back, we're going to talk about you crossing over to the other side mm -hmm. of the camera and doing some directing. Okay, okay guys, hang mm -hmm. on. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, we're back. So Misha, you moved from performing to directing. So can you tell us how that transition came about and what it was like for you working behind the camera as opposed to in front of the camera? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like I transitioned by, by keep performing. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not done with performing, but like this is another path for me. I always wanted to direct. And um, you know what I was, I was um, banned from um, returning to America in 2015 when I was trying to come back in 2015 and basically stopped me and sent me back home. Like oh, everybody, God, knows. Yeah. <laughs> everybody knows, everybody yeah. knows already. Um, so uh, then I decided that I'm going to do everything to come back. Uh, but obviously they banned me for five years. So that was not mm -hmm. so easy to do. Uh, so I decided I'm going to stay relevant. I'm going to, I'm going to keep on performing, but like two years after three years after, um, I decided to do something else. Like I thought I'm like facing the wall and uh, you cannot really evolve as much in Europe as you can in US. So I was like, okay, what can I do? Like, I feel like I want to do something uh, cool because I know I am uh, able to do uh, something more than just performing and I want to start directing. So uh, I emailed John from Evil Angel and I told him, like, I wrote him a very emotional <laughs> email <laughs> that, look, like, I cannot really return to America, uh, but I feel like I am missing something, like, I'm really lacking something. I, I want to feel like I am in charge of my life again. Like, um, I actually am able to do something. It's not like I am only relying on shoots in Europe or something. You know what I mean? 
mm-hmm. and I needed this 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 strength in me again that I am creating something good and that I am staying relevant and that people see it and people talk about it like not in a in a vain way you know what I mean but more like I am doing something relevant so you want um, to you want to feel like I think everybody you want to feel like you have a purpose exactly and that you're being creative and that you have like a path that you're following and you have a goal and you're not exactly. just like on this hamster wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I get exactly. it. Exactly. Um, so, uh, he said, okay, shoot something, show it to me and we will see what we can do with that. So like, then we, we, di- me and Guido, we are partners. Uh, we are directing together. He's my cameraman. Like he's basically, those are our projects. It's not just my projects, but like I am like coming up with, uh, uh ideas most of the time, uh, he's the, the man who is able to put this into life because he's just so talented. He's a genius. He becomes cameras and, and edition and everything. So, um, and also he's very artistic. Uh, we have the same vision. We love the same stuff. So it makes it very easy for us to work together. Um, that's how we made Misha in Exile. And Misha in Exile was actually title uh, invented by John because I didn't know how I should name my first movie, how I should title it. I was like, I want it to be emotional. And like, you know, like I'm coming back <laughs> from the dead. Yeah, 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 or something. Yeah. I just need something that would be good. But also I'm like, English is not my first language. So I don't want to be like cheesy or anything. Like I want it to be good. So John was like, after two minutes that I told him that, he was like, oh, how about Misha in Exile? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's good. Um, and we filmed it in, in Spain. We, f- we were filming it like eight months because we were taking breaks between each scenes. It had five scenes in it. We were taking breaks uh, because, I don't know, that was my first movie. And also I wanted it to be perfect. So I direct, uh, we filmed one scene edited it, sent to John. He said, that's amazing. That's like one of the best things I've ever seen. Directed for Evil Angel. I'm like, okay, well, I'm really happy to hear that. And then we directed other scenes and we released Me Train Exile. And then I was like, oh my God, this is so awesome. Like it basically gave me purpose again. Like it made me feel so alive. It's just like, I can't even explain that it, 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 it did so many, uh, it did so, so much good to me. I felt like I'm in charge of my life again. Uh, I have so much power again. I want to direct. I, this is all that I want to do right now. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the movie specifically? Yeah. Like who was in it, what the scenes were like? Yeah. Um, so it's all Gonzo, but like with all those beautiful kind of like a video clip teasers, um, mm-hmm. So that was my showcase because I wanted, I wanted it to be my showcase because I wanted to be back in the U.S. industry because I haven't been in the U.S. industry for so long. Like, that's just ridiculous. And there's yeah. nothing that I could do about it. So I was like, I need to do a showcase to let people know if, if there are people out there who don't know that I'm still shooting because obviously I'm in Europe and a lot of people don't follow European porn. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to let them know that I am still alive and uh, I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was a showcase and uh I had Eric Everhard in it, uh Ramon Nomar, um uh, oh my god, Lutro, I think he's a performer from Prague. Um and I had Dolly Dior in it in a threesome scene with Ramon. So yeah, I think I used also Eric. So all the scenes were starring you. Yes. Yeah. But you got to direct your own showcase basically. Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's great. Not yeah. a lot of girls don't necessarily get to do that. I, I think that is awesome. When you're given a chance to do it, that's the best mm-hmm. thing to do because you're your own boss. Like, yeah, this is the best thing because you know your body and you know who you like to work with and you, you know what kind of scenes turn you on. Um, you know, like for example, if I'm being booked by someone else and they send me a script and I read it and it's ridiculous. And I'm like, oh my God, I would never ever yeah. shoot something like that or, or, or film right. anything, but it's your vision. And obviously I will do it. And this mm-hmm. way you can do whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so you've, so have you, you've directed other titles since then, correct? Yeah. I did elements and then we did Bacchanalia. 
Fantastic. Do you have any, well, I know we're in quarantine. Nobody's shooting yeah, right no now, worries. but do you yeah. have, do you, do you have any ideas for what, do you think you'll be doing any more? Yeah, like we want it. We want it actually. Yeah. Well, I can't really or say Or next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> or oh, how about 2022? Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> right? I don't know. We were planning to come to LA uh, with Guido and shoot another one in America with American performers. Mm. We were planning to come in May. <laughs> So let me put it this way. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Also, I cannot get my visa renewed in my passport because all the embassies around the world are closed. And yeah. the only thing they tell you is that we don't know when we're going to open again. Yeah, so. that sounds like pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what's different from European porn and American porn because a lot of people in the American porn industry aren't familiar with how European mm -hmm. porn works. And specifically, I wanted to ask you, because another thing that is a very hot topic right now is, is racism in American mm -hmm. porn specifically. Yeah. And from my understanding, the kind of labeling that we do with interracial and, mm -hmm. you know, girls charging more to shoot interracial and girls refusing to do interracial, I hear that's not really a thing in Europe. Um, well, girls charge more for interracial in Europe. So they do do I that. believe it's like a worldwide thing. Okay. Um, not all of them, like it's not, it's not as common as in America because nothing okay. is as common in Europe in porn as in America. Like I mm. always call European porn industry a very, like a, like a ugly sister of American porn industry. Like the ugly, the <laughs> ugly stepsister. Exactly. Redheaded like stepchild. <laughs> Right. Like they want to make it like legit. Well, it is legit, but like it's not working properly. It's not as professional as it is in America. Like uh, m main difference is um, that you're not really represented by agencies. We have agencies, but it's not like uh, like you have in America, like Spiegler, OC, right? Or like ADMLA. <laughs> Yeah, they're kind mm -hmm. of more – one thing I noticed, because I've shot in mm -hmm. Europe a few mm -hmm. times. I used to go and shoot in Prague every year. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I noticed that was a big difference was that one girl could be with several agencies. Right, yeah. It was very thing. confusing to me because here you have one agent and you sign a contract with them. Exactly. And if you try to work with another agent, like, you'll get sued. But agents here also – I mean, they're at least supposed to, they don't always do it, but they also are supposed to act like kind of as managers mm -hmm. as well. And like give you advice on how to build your career and that right. kind of thing. Well, yeah. Career. That's another good word because you are totally able to make a long time career in America, mm. Europe, not so much. Nobody really knows what a word career means. <laughs> like they don't care about awards. They don't care about nominations. So, um, if you win an award, if you're a performer, if you win an award like AVN Best Foreign Female Performer, no one really cares. They don't put this on the website next to your name that you want something. Uh, when they book you, they mostly ask, how much do I need to pay? Mm. Um, yeah, like uh, obviously they know straight away that if you have awards or nominations, you will probably ask for more money. So they don't even ask if you're available. Uh, agencies, they don't even say you're available when you're in town or like if anyone asks for you, they will only recommend, um, I call them like pets. So there are like few girls, for example, in Budapest or in Prague, they're like, they live there and they are kind of like exclusive to the agency, five or six girls. And they will always recommend them. Even if, for example, Misha Cross is in Prague, she's available to be booked, no one's going to say a word because mm. they need to uh, push, push, you know, all those girls who are exclusive to them for whatever mm. reason. Um, another thing is you never get the, um, you know, the, those emails that you send before the shoot to everyone involved. Call in the shoot. Yeah, we, we never get that. I was like, I got it when I was in LA, my agency was asking me if I want to do the booking. And I said, yeah. And then they sent me this call sheet and I'm like, oh my God, that looks amazing. 
wow, I know who I'm going to work with. I know how much money. I, I mean, well, I always ask for money. So like, that's my, that's my big advantage. Yeah. I always ask for You know, for wardrobe, money. the kind like, of scene. Exactly. With time. Where I'm shooting uh, oh God, the script funny. and everything. And in Europe, it's like, hey, this guy asked if you want to do this and that. And I'm like, okay. Okay, then tomorrow this address, 9 a.m. This is all the info you're getting. I don't know how yeah. hard it is for them to make it like in America. Maybe they just don't care or or maybe they just want to take advantage of girls. Uh, I don't know. I mean, do the, do the producers even create call sheets? No. No. No okay. one cares. No yeah, one cares. Yeah, that's a very I, – I think also too like because – you know, a huge portion of the adult industry mm -hmm. in the U.S. is based in Los Angeles and mm -hmm. L.A. is the production hub. You know, that's Hollywood and that's yeah. like the base of pretty much all of the major entertainment all over the world. Right. So a lot of us come from a background of having worked in mainstream and oh, yeah. following right. certain protocols. So that's yeah. just kind of natural. Yeah to us. But yeah, we have very detailed call sheets and we always make sure we send it out at least a week in advance so the girl mm -hmm. knows what's going on. Right. The agents don't always pass it on to the girl like they're mm -hmm. supposed to or they right. send it the day before, but yeah, we but that's always like send out thing, right? Because you yeah. have those call sheets. Yeah. I mean, we even <laughs> ask girls like if they're like allergic to certain kinds of food so we know mm -hmm. like what kind of food to get if they're vegan, like oh, we yeah. bring vegan food like we're very specific. Oh my God. Do you know what? The only company that ever asked me, uh, that ever sent me a call sheet, um, ever the only one. And there were like, there was food preference. If I'm allergic to anything, any lube or any food or anything that was, um, VR cosplay, you know them? Oh wow. They're Americans, right? I think or they should in Europe as well. So, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know them. Yeah. Like, I, I know they shoot a lot in America, uh, but they also had a team in Spain and they were shooting in mm -hmm. Spain. And that was the only company uh, that sent me a call sheet. <laughs> wow. That must have been really impressive. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now we're talking. I thought That's I was so going somewhere away from Budapest to the Hungarian village shooting a POV with a guy. <laughs> that's so funny because we totally take that for granted here. Mm -hmm. You know that that that's exactly what we do. Yeah, but that's why also so. I I stop shooting in Europe. Like I am not as mm -hmm. active in Europe as I was in the beginning because I very soon realized how different it is, and um, and it's just not worth it. And also, it's just um, you know people taking advantage of you, and also all the stress coming along with that with that lack of information or once I was even sent to a shit that I was not even I, I was not sure if it was not um you know like a meeting or something like an escorting gig yeah, I am yeah. you show up and it's one guy and a camera I, in a hotel room and you're like even today I am not sure what it was and it was sent through an agency in Budapest I arrived the guys were like um I think they were hangover. Uh, mm -hmm. There were two guys there. And then our shoot started. Like, obviously, they gave me food. They gave me not alcohol, but like they gave me drinks. And it was fun. And then the shoot started and they were wearing like, you know, those uh, hats that cover your face. Mm -hmm. was, you know what, what I mean? like a mask? You want to rob a bank? <laughs> oh, like a ski mask. And I was like, oh. I am not sure what, what's happening. And they said, oh, this is how the website's going to look. Like, because this is the theme for our movies. And I'm like, guys oh. in ski masks. Yeah. And I'm was like, it like, was it like a non-consent, like fake rape scene? No, no, no. It was scene? like, I, it was like, I came to the room. I was like being, uh, just normal. It was not anything like weird, but like they were wearing those ski masks. And I asked them, why are you wearing them? You don't want to show your face. Or like, are you amateur production or like, what is this? Oh, this is the theme because, you know, we have these guys that not, not co covering their faces, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I, I remember I watched, I watched up my agent, my agent, and she was like, oh, it's fine. You know, so many girls shot with them. It's fine. Hmm. That was like one of my first shoots. And like, obviously everything was fine. Nothing weird happened. Uh, and I know that those guys are still shooting, like they are still shooting. They are filming, they are booking girls. Uh, they are going out for dinners with agents, with producers. So, um, 
that's even weirder to me, if you know what I mean. Have you seen the website? No, obviously not. I don't even know how it's called anymore. Guys with so ski masks. That's, that's com. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's not an this escort. Is a weird com. fetish. <laughs> it's a proper porn shoot, not an escort.com. I don't even know what it was, but it was wow. weird. And to this day, I don't know. I don't know what it was. And you see, this, this is this is the difference between American and your industry. You're never sure what you're getting into. <laughs> Yeah, though to be fair, we have some agents that here on this end will also send girls on sketchy bookings, but mm -hmm. you know, those are becoming fewer and far between. If you stick with the bigger, more mainstream talent yeah. agencies, they, you know, are pretty particular about who they work with and mm -hmm. and and they'll vet uh producers. But yeah, right. that's that's weird. Maybe it was some kind of like, I don't know, maybe it was a ski mask fetish. I mean, Everybody's got a fetish for something. So Misha, I know that you have been shooting a lot of custom videos for your personal content platforms, especially during this time of quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I love talking about custom porn requests because they're always so interesting. And I think it's such an, a valuable insight into, you know, the human mind and this strange right. multifaceted <laughs> human sexuality that, uh, that we experienced. So what have been some of the strangest custom videos that you've been requested to do? And what are the most common ones? Um, yeah. So m one of the most common ones, like obviously boy girl scenes, that's not even a fetish. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's what, what yeah, it's guys just like want to, or like J O Y's guys love jerk, jerk off instructions jerk for people who don't know. Yeah. Jerk off instructions is basically when a girl records herself, um, doing some dirty talk and telling you how to touch yourself, how to make yourself count. Mm -hmm. Like when I first heard about it, because uh, I only found out about JOIs like a year ago, when I started my OnlyFans and my Snapchat, I had no idea what this is. I had to Google it. I had to search it on like online. I had no idea how to do it. And I saw other girls doing very successful, doing so well in shooting JOIs. I was actually uh, amazed that guys want to see us girls telling them how to touch themselves and how to make them come. Like I would never ever even think about something like that. I don't know. I don't know if you- You'd you, figure these guys watch porn so clearly they know how to yeah, touch like they themselves. Know how, yeah, but they that's a lot fetish. of practice. Yeah, but that's like a fetish. Yeah. They want a girl mm -hmm. to tell them how to do it. Even if she has yeah. no idea how to say it, like, you know, because yeah. I don't have a penis, I might not tell you correctly how to do and it. every guy's yeah and every guy's different on how they like exactly. to be touched and, and what like, they're sensitive to sometimes i just I, I even you know ask myself like oh my god am, am i doing it right like i am telling them this and that like i'm telling them, oh now i don't know like rub the the head of your cock or something like do they like it i don't know but it doesn't matter apparently because all they want is to is to see you telling them all those dirty things that's mm -hmm. what's turning on for them mm -hmm. um so, but that's like a common fetish. Another, uh, well, a weird fetish was, um, I've never heard about it. I don't know if you heard about it, but apparently there are people out there who are into um, seeing girls carrying other girls. Yes, the carrying fetish. Oh my God. Oh, yes. How I know all crazy. about this. It's really bizarre. <laughs> that's bizarre. That's like, I had this guy on my Snapchat. He was like, subscribing back and forth only to ask me this question if i'm able to shoot this custom for him uh he was always asking the same question like he thought i would not remember him or something he had the same name on snapchat you're <laughs> so, like dude you've asked me several times yeah. one very specific custom yeah, video like, I, I, I nobody remember. else has asked her <laughs> yeah so he always asked like oh can you can you shoot with this girl do you think you can carry her oh that would be so hot if you carried her like Oh, but also COVID, you know, I can't really travel. Yeah, that's true. Does he, cause I, I, I know girls that have done this, like girls who would like years ago, I think mm -hmm. Danielle Trixie was the first person who told mm -hmm. me about it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, back when everyone, the only place to do this kind of stuff was clips for sale. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, they don't even care if you're naked. They mm -hmm. just want to see you carrying yeah. the other person it's not even like sexual if you think about it it's not sexual for you yeah. but it's apparently very sexual for them you can be yeah. wearing like a 
you know, jacket <laughs> and boots. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just crazy. And then there was, um, uh, well, the guys that the, the feet guys, obviously they want their name yeah. written on, on my soles or like, I don't know, whatever. Like it's just a picture of my feet, like with their name on it. And they apparently mm -hmm. jerk off to it. Um, but fetish is big. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> it's just crazy. But also a lot of weird guys who ask for really weird stuff that I would never mm -hmm. do. You know, yeah. the taboo things. I had no idea how many people out there like dirty stuff, mm. like proper dirty stuff. So like, like, like what? Like number two, you know what I mean? Oh, the poop shitting yeah. thing. <laughs> oh, I have a, so everybody who listens to my podcast knows <laughs> I have a specific guy who writes to me like once a year to see if I've changed my mind. Oh my God. A very well written, eloquent email about how he wants to eat my poop. Oh my God. It, yeah. He calls it toilet, my toilet treats. Yeah. Or he calls it uh, like scat caviar. Oh yeah. Oh my God. I heard this name before. Yeah. Yeah. He's written to a few girls, but uh, every time he comes back to me and he's just like, Hey, I want to see if you change your mind. I'm willing to offer you more money. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even have to be there to see you do it. We can just rent a hotel room. You can go like poop in a silver dish and then leave and then I'll enjoy like a hot meal. It's Oh my God. It's wow. a thing. And I wonder honestly if it's just like for him, like if I said yes, mm -hmm. if he would actually follow through or if he just gets off on writing these emails to people. Oh, like yeah. I'm not entirely sure if he even – is interested in eating my scat caviar or if he just oh. likes the idea <laughs> that favorite. like I would read and talk about this, you know? Oh my God. That is, that is a very good point. Actually, that there, there's yeah. a lot of guys out there that just get off to writing really long custom requests uh, yeah. and they write it and, and you know, you know, like they have a hard on writing it and it doesn't even yeah. matter if you do it. Like he just needed to write it just to release mm -hmm. this tension. Yeah. I, I yeah. had a guy like that, a uh, speed guy again. Um, and I received a long ass essay, like what he wants, what kind of angles, like what kind of poses and all of that. Like, it was so long. I would need to be paid to read that. <laughs> but yeah. like, yeah, I am pretty sure that's what he's into just like writing this and just you know like imagining all of that that's another fetish writing custom requests <laughs> yeah yeah i know right that's like a fetish all on its own <laughs> right so uh you as a woman having performed in front of the camera mm -hmm. and behind the camera um how do you feel like how do you feel ultimately about porn and about sex like can it be empowering for women or is it ultimately exploitative? What's your opinion? Um, I believe it's very empowering, but other people make it exploitive. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, because, um, well, when I do porn, like, when I decided to do porn, I, I knew it will be empowering for me because I like sex. I use sex to make money. I know how to do it. I always felt sexual but i always felt also like i want to make money with my body and it's completely fine and i never saw anything bad about it it made me feel really good it made me feel so good to wake up every day and get pretty in front of the camera like it was boosting my ego as well and made mm -hmm. me feel really good about myself but then other people made it made me feel as if it's something wrong that mm -hmm. I shouldn't be doing it. And there is something wrong with you that you're feeling good about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, if you feel like it's empowering, that's one thing, but then, um, but then we get overcasted by other people's opinion, by mainstream opinion about sex work. Uh, so th duality is very real in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the stigma is definitely mm -hmm. real and it's infuriating for me because, you know, when you, 
I, I've said this many times. Mm-hmm. People are probably sick of me hearing, hearing <laughs> me say it, but I think it's really important to recognize that everybody experiences everything differently. Exactly. And That's that it. Yeah. We are all different people and right. that we all come to, you know, this, a similar situation with right. a different attitude and a different opinion and everybody's opinion is valid right. and everybody's experience is valid. Right. But just because you don't enjoy the idea or if you've done it performing in porn in front of the camera, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to, but that doesn't mean that another person can't enjoy it. And Mm -hmm. we, we always project our own internal biases on other people. And we always think like, well, I could never do something Mm -hmm. like that. If I did that, I would feel dirty and used. So that must be how she feels because Mm -hmm. she should feel exactly the way I do because I can only imagine the world in my own little brain. Right. And everybody thinking the same way that I do. So, you know, there's no way that she could possibly feel differently than mm-hmm. me because I can't imagine a planet where people have different opinions than I do yeah. and different experiences than I do. And that's to me incredibly frustrating because if you do porn, like here's a great example. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Mia Khalifa has been trending mm-hmm. online again and, right. you know, she keeps talking about how she had a really terrible experience in porn. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say that she didn't, mm-hmm. you know, and she very much regrets it. Yeah. I don't want to say that, she, you know, I'm not going to say that she didn't. Um, if she had a bad experience, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I really feel for her. And, you know, I wish that, you know, she can hopefully move past it and continue on with her life in a different way. But, you know, that doesn't mean that other, that all women have that experience. And right. I think that, you know, people take a story like that and they use it to paint this overall broad reaching picture of like her experience is like everybody else's, right. but all the other girls just don't realize it yet. Like they're not aware that they're having a bad experience because they're on drugs or they're being pushed into mm-hmm. a boy, a boyfriend or because of money yeah. or just because they're mentally incapable of recognizing that. And that's really annoying because that takes uh, the power of choice away from women. And right. I find that inherently sexist in itself. So, Right. And this is not what feminism is, at least right. to me. Like yeah. when I was growing up, I always wanted to do whatever the fuck I wanted to do. And I believe that was feminism. Like that's a shortcut really, but like that was yeah. feminism to me. And now with the modern feminism, whatever, whatever that's called, it's like um, slut shaming, you know, like, oh, so I'm not in charge of my body anymore. Like, wait, yeah. didn't we like fight for it for all those years that I am yeah. able to do whatever I want with my body? And now you're saying like, no, because uh, I am serving a man who's directing the movie. Like, that's just, that's just nonsense to me. So I, if, if someone asked me if I'm a feminist like in 2020, I would definitely say no, because I just don't stand for whatever is being, um, whatever is being uh, stated by modern feminists right now. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what your idea of what feminism means. So we mm-hmm. actually have a really great term um, that is, I think, really appropriate for uh, describing the kind of feminism that you're talking about, mm-hmm. which is, so we call these women swerfs. Okay. So they're sex exclusionary mm-hmm. um, radical feminists. Okay. So they're feminists and they believe in women having charge of their own body and making right. their own decisions, except when it comes to sex work. Okay. Right, 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 right. That doesn't count. You know, <laughs> count you can make all the choices. <laughs> right. You can make all these choices about your own body mm-hmm. in all these different ways, yeah. except for when it comes to sex, yeah. because you couldn't possibly enjoy sex as a woman because right. it's all for men. And so it's just like, right. it's really backwards, but yeah, it just, you know, it depends on what you determine feminism is. Like mm-hmm. if you decide if feminism to you, to me, like feminism is just about like, trying to balance the inequality between men and women. Right. Mm -hmm, Right. So therefore, like I would say that, yeah, sure. I'm a feminist. I mean, and in the example of, you know, whether or not women are exploited by porn, like, Mm -hmm. do you ever see people rallying for getting men out of porn? Do you ever hear about that? You never hear about like no. all these poor men, they're being made to do, they got to keep right. their dicks hard all day. And then they right. got to take Viagra and like, and you know, it's a thing like men can yeah. be exploited by porn, but people don't talk about that yeah. because 
men have always been seen as being like these strong creatures that understand the decisions that they're making and can bear the responsibilities. But, you know, women, we still cast them in this victim role. Mm-hmm. Um, who can't, sorry. I go, you get me talking about this and I go fucking on. It's, it's I know. <laughs> It's a really great topic to talk about. I love this topic. Yeah, but like, but also like when you, when you go on Instagram, um, simple, simple example, like, uh, when a porn star, uh, posts a picture of her being pregnant, Mm -hmm. right? All the comments, like 99% of the comments are like, who's the daddy? That is, that is so like, you know what? I don't even go on Instagram anymore. Uh, when I know there is some controversial, controversial shit going on in the comments, like I don't even open that because I am boiling. I am <laughs> enraged. I just, I, I don't even like want to start this. This makes me so angry. And then I go on, uh, male performers only, uh, Instagram accounts. And it's like, you know, they just praise those guys like, oh man, you're the dude. Like, you know, completely different story. So are you talking about men, like male performers who are fathers? Yeah. Who are fathers or like whose girlfriend is pregnant. They're like, right. Oh, you're going to have a baby. Oh, you're the man, dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, like two different stories completely. So like, this is, this is just horrid to me. I am getting so mad just even thinking about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's uh, a lot of that. Yeah. There's still a lot of inequality between men and women, but you know, but also women is always a property of a man because yeah. also in the comments you can find, um, people writing, Oh, remember this is someone's daughter. This is someone's sister. So woman is always, uh, a property of a man. Yeah, this is what true. describes us. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's true. I never actually thought about it specifically mm-hmm. in that way because you never see, again, it's the same thing. Flip the script. You see a male performer, you never see it's like, this is somebody's son. No. And he's out there banging all these chicks. Right. No, oh, it's never terrible. Like you never hear that. It's always about, yeah, you're right. It's always about the woman being owned by somebody's. Yep. Yeah. And it's always like, you're right, someone's daughter, someone's sister. Yep. <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyways, oh well, thank God. you so much, Misha, for coming on. It was really good to see you. That was amazing. Thank you. So can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, plug any websites that you want to plug anything right. like that? So you can find me on my free socials on Twitter. It's X Misha cross X. Instagram is the same. It's X Misha cross X. And I have only fans as we <laughs> spoke about it. Um, it's uh, sunlitsmat.com and you can also find it linked on my Twitter and on my Instagram. So this is where I'm shooting right now um, during quarantine. Uh, so we can ask maybe for a crazy custom, like maybe carrying a girl or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> carrying a girl while eating poop at the or same time poop. and having your name <laughs> on the bottom of her feet. So many <laughs> options. <laughs> And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast, as always, you can go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Don't forget. I have a Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And of course go to Holly Randall unfiltered.com. Join my mailing list where you can keep up to date on all the news about the podcast and everything that's coming up. Thank you guys so much for watching. Misha, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So much fun. (laughs) Yeah, of course. See you guys next week.